My friends, I'm not too proud to tell you that I almost got ahead of myself again. You know, I get so many interruptions and there's so many things going on that I just, you know, I just rush here, rush there, do this, do that. And I was just about ready to go ahead and glue this onto the sides because the sides are finished now. You know, all the kerfing is in there. I also ran these sides through my thickness sander to get them perfectly flat and smooth all the way on, around on both sides. I'll get them to the proper width and everything. And speaking of that, these sides are going to be gorgeous. I don't know if you can see all that curl, but once that gets stained, it's really going to be something. But anyway, I almost got ahead of myself and glued them together. And then I thought, you know, I probably ought to cut the F holes. <laughs> oh yeah, and I might want to put the braces in too. <laughs> Just hurry up and screw up. That's my middle name. So here we go. We're going to put the, uh, we're going to do that now. We're going to mark it out for the um, braces. I'll probably put the braces in first and then I'll do the F holes because the brace even makes it stiff while I'm sawing the F holes out. So that's not a bad thing to have those in there ahead of time. So here we go. I believe I've shown before on my pattern, I have pretty much everything figured out on this pattern. All these little tiny holes are where I check my dimensions. All, there's a bunch of holes around on this. And then these other little rectangular holes are where the ends of the braces go. So I can just mark them out like that and know that they're going in the appropriate place. And so now I'll make me some braces that fit in these spots right here. Well, my friends, you can probably see the problem. I have this little square board and it has to fit into a round bottom spot there. And how do you get that to do that? That's the question. So this brace has to be contoured to fit this place where it's carved into there. So I use this brilliant piece of engineering here. This is a masterful piece of engineering, I might say. Been using this same little block of wood with a hole in it for years. And there's my public calling. Well, that little interruption, my friends, was slightly humorous. And Steve, if you're watching, I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh at you, but you know, you've heard the old joke, my dog ate my homework. Well, his dog ate his guitar saddle. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> anyway, back to this genius piece of engineering. I've been using this same little block of wood with that hole in it for, I don't know, probably 35, 40 years, whatever, probably as long as I've been building instruments. All I do is I just take the insert out of a ballpoint pen, slide it through that hole, and then I just take it and walk it right along like that. And you can see it makes a perfect little line right there. And that matches that contour. And so basically, I just cut that out and make sure I keep this side turned toward the center. In fact, I'll even, you know, like put an X on that that I know that that goes toward the center. And then I go over and saw this out and come over here and fit it and just keep fitting it until I get it perfect on the bottom. After you saw that out, the next step is taking a piece of sandpaper, putting it on here, and rubbing it back and forth until you get a just perfect matchup. And I don't have a perfect matchup yet, but it's pretty close. But referring back to the dog that ate the guy's saddle, Caleb had the best line. He said that the dog probably thought the saddle needed a little more bark, which I thought, yeah, that probably makes sense. <laughs> I've got the braces fitted up really tight to the top now, and so we're going to glue them in place. It's very important that these braces fit just like a glove. In other words, you don't want any air spaces in between them. Otherwise, you're going to be corrupting the shape of your top. And I'll put a big pad of leather under it and put the spring clamp right there on the end. And one test you can do is when you do that, see it didn't raise the other end up. So you know it's pretty much fitted. If there would be a high spot in the middle, it would rock this up. So it's fitted really well. Okay, 
and that's nice and I think maybe I'll go ahead and put two clamps in the middle as well just to uh, make sure it's clamped as tightly as possible or you know I just don't want any air gaps I think that'll be fine that's the base bar and now we'll do the treble bar the treble bar is a little bit thinner, a little more delicate, otherwise about the same. What I just noticed is that top of this brace isn't flat, it's crooked, and that's creating a little problem with the, uh, with the clamp up here, so I'm going to flatten this off a little bit. Well, there you go. That's what she looks like all clamped up, and that should set now for oh at least an hour probably two hours and then we'll uh, move on to the next step it's been several hours these braces are tight now and ready to be carved i am going to try to use the new chisel that i think colin sent to me i didn't have a name with this gift and I've already taken it to the grinder and I've hollow ground this tip. You can see there, like this used to have a pretty short bevel on it. I've lengthened the bevel back and that curvature there that you might be able to see is the exact curvature of the grinding wheel because I'm holding it on there and I keep it moving it across the grinding wheel in that one plane so that I get one continuous grind across there. It's called hollow grinding. And the only other trick you need to know about that is that you, you know, you have to keep it at the same angle, of course, but the next thing is you don't want to overheat your blade. You want to make sure you don't turn your blade colors, you know, just do a little bit of grinding, be patient, put it in the water, cool it off, a little more grinding, you know, until you get it right up to that edge. And you can tell you get to the edge when the sparks start just trickling over that edge. When they just start trickling over that edge, just very lightly, then you're right at the edge. Then once you get that hollow grind, the cool thing about that is the back of this is flat and the front of that is flat. And you can just set it on those two flats like that. And then you can just hone it on your um, whetstone like this. And it's very easy to know that your angle is perfect because it is perfect. And it doesn't take but just a few minutes this way. And I mean, like seriously, it's the fastest way ever to sharpen a chisel. There's nothing you can do that would be faster and or sharper. Then you just flatten off the back edge just to knock any burrs off. And that's, you just do that flat. You don't make any angle on that. You know, some people talk about the figure eight, but to me, it's more important to be consistent on your angle. And whatever works for you, if the figure eight is the way you like to do it, that's fine. I typically just move in a circular pattern. It doesn't really matter. The blade doesn't care. All I care about is that it gets absolutely razor sharp. And I can already tell you this is very close to razor sharp, if not there already. And I'm just going to do a little bit more honing. I didn't even bother going through the other grits because you don't need to with this method. Just go straight to your fine and you'll be fine. That is really sharp, I can see already. It might already shave without even honing it on the leather. It's pretty sharp. Uh, not quite. Not quite. It's, it's real close to that, though. But that's real time. You saw this in real time. I didn't uh, speed it up or anything. And it's, it's seriously very, very, very sharp. We'll take the leather now and we'll strop it on the leather. This is a little awkward because of the curve in this blade, so I'm having to get off to the side in order to get the flatness down here. That's very sharp. That ought to shave now. Yep, no problem at all. Yeah, it's shaving very good, in fact. 
yeah, no problem at all. A little more honing wouldn't hurt it, but it's, it's very, very, very sharp. It's amazing that leather can sharpen steel, but it can. Very, very sharp. So now we should be able to carve the ends of these braces off. And I have never used this chisel, so I don't even know what to expect here, but let's just see how it goes. Takes a little while to get your technique down with any new tool. It actually feels a little awkward to me because of the curve more than anything, but that's what it's designed for, is for these ends and things. But to be honest, it does feel a little awkward. It's a little big, too, for this purpose, I think. It does feel a little uh, different um, because of that steep curve in it. I don't know. Sharpened a little bit more. I thought I had it perfectly there, but I think there was a wire edge on there, and that wire edge may have come off. A few folks have made fun of me saying, why is uh, shaving the standard for whether a blade is sharp or not? Well, you know, most blades won't shave. And until they shave, they're not as sharp as they can be. And this one is shaving just fine. It's shaving very well. So it's about as sharp as a razor. But I'm still finding it a bit awkward, I'll just be honest with you. Partly because this is going to be rocking on me, but it's just a different feel than the other chisels by quite a bit. It puts your hand at an angle that feels awkward to me versus the standard chisel. Let me just get one of those. Um, this actually feels much more uh, comfortable to me for some reason. I don't know. I feel more comfortable using that, I think. And as sharp as that is, it still doesn't seem like it cuts as good as the other one. It may just because it's so wide, I don't know. But it is very sharp. It does not feel like it cuts as good, though, for some reason. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll have to practice with that one some more, I guess, because it just doesn't seem like it's cutting as good as it could. Yeah, that knocks it down enough to, you know, I probably should have cut these down more before I started and that would have been a good idea but this kind of bracing it really cuts down very quick with a uh, finger plane once you get your finger plane set to the proper depth I had it set for the maple and it needs to be set deeper for this spruce It just peels it right off of there. I mean, it doesn't take, but just a few, a few, a few strokes, and you're down to where you need to be. So that's why I don't really care if I, you know, cut them down to size before I glue them in or not. It really doesn't make much difference. Now, all wood likes to be carved in one direction. This wants to be carved this way. You can see the difference in size pretty quickly, how small this one is now compared to this big one. 
it only took a few strokes to get it down there like that. A sharp finger plane is an incredible tool. Takes the wood off just like a zipper. This side of the brace wants to be carved this way. This side of the brace wants to be carved this way. And when you can tell that real super quick, like I can now, you've probably been doing this too long. I, mean, I probably need another hobby, like maybe uh, golf or something. No, that would hurt too much. Can't swing, can't twist that much. And I don't want to try fishing because if I was sitting on the bank, I'd be wishing I was back making instruments. So maybe I should just stick with this. I just do this by eye and by feel. I don't like big intrusive braces. They don't need to be that large on a mandolin. Of course, you can get them too small, but they don't need to be real, real large. Really, really uh, just about there. I'll carve this other one, then I'll tap on this and let you hear it, and then we'll cut out the F holes. Okay, so there it is, how big it is. Watch how few strokes it takes to get it down there. Oh, it's gonna, it wants to be carved the other way, I think. I didn't count them, but that it's getting down there pretty close already. And that was a pretty, pretty thick brace. Or tall brace, I guess I'd say. This is gonna be the treble side, so this brace is gonna be a little bit more dainty. Yeah, that one does not wanna be carved that direction at all. That's getting pretty close on the uh, carving of those braces. Yeah, oh yeah. Listen to that. From this distance, I can hear it, hear it that long. When I get my ear right up to it, I can hear it longer. Very consistent tone. You know, you can... If you don't carve these things right, you'll hear a dissonant note in the top just like you hear when the intonation is wrong. You gotta get it right. Now, the thing about that is, you try not to hit a note that's one of your open strings. So in other words, I don't really want it to be a, a straight D because a D will you know, ring like an open string. And so your mandolin will be a lot louder in the D chord and it'll also be a lot louder uh, just on that open D string. So I try to find a note that's somewhere in between, like maybe a B flat or something like that. Now I haven't tested this yet. It's got a beautiful sound. It's got a real clear, real clear note. It's not dissonant at all. 
So sometimes that's good enough. But let me just double check it and see if I can tell you what note I think it is. My friends, the best I can tell, the tuner goes to a G sharp and it's even a little sharp of the G sharp. So that's not a bad note. It's really, it's really clear, really a nice clear note. Um, sometimes that's what you just want to stop at when you get a nice clear punching note like that. Now it may change when I cut the F holes in it. You know, it may go down. I would say it'll probably go down in pitch. That's my guess. We'll see. My friends, I'm getting ready to put in the reinforcement around the F holes. I've got them marked on the inside already. And basically I just put in a gauze over the uh, F hole like this and we glue it in. I typically glue it in with just Elmer's glue, just white glue. I've been using this same box of gauze for years. This is a tubular gauze. In other words, it comes as a tube and I just slice it down both sides and cut it to length, you know, and uh, then I just glue it in, into place. Seems to work just fine for this purpose. Put a lot of glue on that just to help soak up into the gauze. I should have cleaned all the sawdust off of this table here before I started this so I don't get sawdust mixed in, but I didn't. So that's how you do it basically, you just spread it out. And I'm sure some of you are wondering why do you need this? Well, you know, there's a lot of instruments made that don't have this, but Lloyd Lore put this in around his F holes on his mandolins. And I figured if it was good enough for him, it's good enough for me. So that's why I do it. It's just to give it additional support to keep those F holes from cracking. You know, they can get bumped and crack real easily. If I'm not mistaken, that's what cracked on a mandolin that I was working on one time. It was a video a couple years back. You could find the video, I'm sure. I think it was a Sam Bush mandolin. Anyway, the vacuum hose dropped and tapped the uh, mandolin right there on the F hole, of course, right in the weakest spot, and of course it caused a crack. Now, I'm not saying it wouldn't have cracked with this on there, but I kind of think it would have had a better chance, let's just say it that way. So there you go, we'll let that set and dry overnight. Well, my friends, I just finished carving the F holes and cleaning them all up. I didn't really show any of that. I did show cutting the F holes out with the hole saw on a live broadcast earlier today. And today is September 18th, 2020. So if you want to see how I actually sawed these out, you can look at that live broadcast that was filmed earlier today. But anyway, it's in really good shape. I don't know if the camera is going to get it again or not, but hopefully maybe you can hear it. It's got a great sound, got a great tone, really nice tone, and, and a long sustain, about that long. And uh, the note that I'm hearing primarily is just a straight B. Now B is okay because, again, it's not an open string. You know, if it came out on a D or something like that, well then that's not necessarily the best. I'm pretty happy with this. I'm probably going to leave it just like it is. A lot of times I like to let them set for a day or two, pick them back up, listen a little bit more, you know. Sometimes I tweak them a little more. I never know, you know. I just get the right feeling, it seems like, to do what I need to do. But right at the moment, um, I think I'm just going to let it set for a little while. I'm going to take a little break, maybe head to lunch, and come back and listen to it again and see if I still like it. But, but where right now, it's got a nice, nice tone. Well, I think I'm just about satisfied with the way this has turned out now. I've even carved the braces down a little bit more. The braces should be, you know, solid but delicate. You don't want them too large. And I've carved them down and I'm real happy with the sound I'm getting. It's, it's clear, it's nice, and, and uh, according to this, it's a B. And before I carved the braces down, it was a good, strong, straight up and down B, almost a perfect 
pitch note B. And now that I've carved the braces down, it's dropped it about 50 cents. So it's a, about 50 cents short of a B now, if you will. And I think I'll leave it right there. It's got a real clear, nice sound. The thicknesses are all good, so I'm happy with that. We're gonna get this attached to the sides. I've got the glue spread around on these sides, as you can see. I'm just gonna go ahead and use a paintbrush. I could have probably used one of those little flat paddles, uh, plastic paddles to spread this out, but I don't know. I'm old school and the paintbrush works pretty good. The paddle probably works the best on real flat areas. This is flat, but it's got all these serrations in it. It looks real good. We'll set this in place. And we'll start clamping her down. We won't tighten the clamps down very tight at the beginning. We'll wait until we get a few on it and get it lined up real good. Fits up really nice, so I think we're in good shape. We can go ahead and tighten these down now and start putting the rest of them on. And I'll show you what it looks like after I get her all clamped up. Well, there you go. That's what she looks like all clamped up. Here's what she looks like from the inside. Looking good. Should be perfect. It'll probably sit that way most of the weekend at least because uh, it is Friday afternoon. I think I'm gonna turn my attention to gluing up the neck block, which I haven't uh, started yet. So we'll get going on that. My friends, I'm about ready to use my vacuum pressing systems bag to glue up the neck blank. You can see here, I've got a whole bunch of parts. This is uh, the uh, quilted maple on both sides. Really pretty stuff. On the middle, I've got uh, two sheets of walnut and a sheet of just plain maple on the middle. Actually, it's a curly maple in the middle, but you can't really tell the difference on the maple, so it doesn't matter what kind. It's just for the black-white-black effect or the dark-white-dark effect. And all I really need to do now before I put it in the system here is to coat all sides with the glue got a new bottle here of tight bond original haven't even opened it yet that way I can get a good flow maybe get too good a flow here <laughs> and I just want to use this paddle to spread the glue because it's so much faster on a flat surface to use a paddle and really you know until you viewers sent me these paddles I never really used anything but the brushes so you know I can learn new tricks just like you guys can paddles really are the way to go whenever you're spreading glue on a flat surface if you have large flat panels to clamp up or glue up I would definitely recommend you check into these vacuum pressing systems vacuum bags and their their whole line this is one of their smaller ones this is called the compact 150 and you can Google that, I'm sure, and find it. It's a really good unit, plenty big for what I do. If you were into really large panels, like cabinet panels and things, you might need the next size bigger. But this one will do a pretty good size, roughly, roughly 30 inches by three foot. I haven't measured it, but I used to know what the dimensions were, but I've forgotten. All I know is it's plenty big to do what I need to do. Before very long, I'm going to get into making some real custom bindings and laminates for decorating the backs of instruments and things. And I'll be using this vacuum system for gluing up all those parts as well. But right now, I'm doing good just to keep up with the instruments I'm building. This mandolin and the guitar that I'm building also at the same time here. When you glue up uh, that many pieces of wood, there's a lot of sides to put, spread glue on, I can tell you for sure. These glue paddles really do 
help that a lot along. You could just use a flat little stick of wood and it would work fine too, I'm sure. Okay, two more surfaces and then we're ready to get to put this thing in the vacuum press. If you know anything about gluing up flat panels and with all this glue, it's just like your car tires, it hydroplanes and when you try to start pressing this together it starts sliding and it's just nearly impossible to keep it perfect. So two things I do to help that out. Number one is I make these panels just a little bit oversized and that helps. The next thing I do is I, I'm going to wrap them with tape and maybe even with some saran wrap, uh, you know, some of that uh, package wrapping, I forget what you call that stuff now, shrink wrap. Maybe even with some of that. To alleviate the sliding effect. Anyway, we'll see how it goes. I'll shut the camera off for a minute, I'm going to wrap this up. I wrap this up with the cling wrap, like so. I'm going to set it in here. I'm hoping that'll be enough to keep it straight because it does want to float, trust me. It's just like hydroplaning. It just slides everywhere. The suction hose is coming up underneath this wooden platen that's in there and then there's slots cut in that platen to let the air flow all underneath what I'm laying on top of it there. I'm also taking this slick board platen, one that I've sanded really smooth. The edges are rounded off. I'm going to lay that on top just to protect my plastic bag here so that it doesn't cut the plastic bag, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And now we just close up this end and I'd tell you I was an expert at doing that, but I'm not. It's been a little while since I've done one and I have to be retrained. If I take a coffee break, I always have to be retrained. So, there we got it rolled up there, and then all we do is we slide on this extra plastic to lock it down to seal it, and uh, this is where the pressure is, because it takes quite a bit of pressure to get that black to go over that. It fits tight, I can tell you that. I had that on there, but I don't think I was happy with it, so I'm going to do it again, let it overlap a little bit further. Just squeezing this really tight. It's not in camera for you to see, I don't think, but it's it's pretty hard to squeeze, and with my hands as sore as they are these days, it doesn't make it any easier, and it's really hard to squeeze. I'm getting it, but it's taking about all I got to get it there. Maybe I can force it down on top of what I've got laying there because it's just not going. Oh, it just popped back out. It, it went the opposite way. Well, I'll get that on. I'll bring the camera back and show you. All right, it, you know, with my arthritic a carpal tunnel hands, that was honestly very tough to squeeze down. I could have done that a year ago without much trouble. Not so much anymore. Now I've got everything lined up here in the bag and I'm going to turn on the press, the vacuum I'm sh I should call it I guess. There's a continuous run mode and then there's a auto cycling mode and I'm going to turn it on the auto cycling and it will start sucking the air out of this bag. It takes it a couple of minutes but not too long. And I'm just going to try to keep things lined up is all I'm going to try to do. Once it sucks the air out, you don't get to move anything. And you can start to see the bag shrinking now, or at least I can see it. I don't know if it shows up in the camera. It's shrinking, it's shrinking. Yeah, 
you don't move it now, trust me. It it's immovable at this point. And it shut off because it has sucked up to the uh, proper vacuum level and that is about oh 21 or 22 is what it's got there a minus 21 22 anyway it should kind of hold it there and it'll kick back on any any moment as it loses air it'll kick back on and it'll just keep it at about that pressure and let me tell you, that is tight. You are not going to move that. You couldn't move that if your life depended on it, I don't think. And there it kicked back on. So there you go. It just runs for a little while till it, and it just keeps the pressure even. So we'll show you what that looks like when it comes out of the bag. My friends, it's the next morning here in the shop, Saturday morning. Nobody's in the shop but me. I took this out of the vacuum pressing systems bag. And wow, it, you just would be hard pressed to find a better way to clamp up things like this. It's really nice. I mean, I used to do it before and I got the job done with a whole bunch of C-clamps, but you seriously would have to put on a minimum, a minimum of a dozen clamps to make this as good as this is. And I didn't have to put a single clamp on this. I just stick it in the bag and turn the switch, you know. So if you really do glue up a lot of flat stuff, look into the vacuum pressing systems. Yeah, they're expensive, but if you do it a lot, it'll pay for itself in the first couple of times you use it. It really will. In addition to that being ready, you can see now that this is all one piece. So we're moving down the road on building this mandolin. I haven't been working that much on instruments on Saturdays lately, but you know, I've got a lot of people waiting on me, so I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and at least get this up to the point where I can cut the truss rod in it. So I'm going to plane this off good and flat to get the uh, top of the neck, and then I think I'll cut the truss rod slot and get that ready to go. Well, you can probably see I have the slot cut in there. The truss rod fits it like a glove. It doesn't have any side-to-side -side play at all, which is exactly what you want. You just want it to go in there, not tight, not crazy tight, but you don't want it to have any extra play that it doesn't need. So it's in there nice and snug. And I only cut it to about 400 thousandths of an inch deep, which um, it's a little more than a 3 8 inch depth for those of you who know the inch system. And millimeter wise, that would be about 10 millimeters, roughly, 400 thousandths. So there you go. It's just weird that a woodworker like me only measures in thousands <laughs> of an inch. So I think I've got the neck profiled there. I think I'm going to go ahead and cut out the profile. I mean, it is Saturday. Like I said, I don't typically work on the Saturdays that much anymore. But then I think what I'll do is after I cut out that profile, then I'll go ahead and get the wings glued on this and clamped up. And then that way for Monday, then I should be able to just knock out the rest of the neck on Monday without any real problem. Because it only takes me a couple hours to make the neck once I get it all glued up, you know, ready to go. So... That way I'll be ahead of the game starting on Monday. Well, here we are at the bandsaw. Let's get this thing cut out. My uh, friend that you'll hear more about later sent me the uh, laser line deal and I'm gonna use that as help me align up here as I cut this. The negative is I almost have to turn off the extra light to see the red light. I'm not good with the color red. So I see a line there, and it does look red to me, I'll admit, but unless I turn all the other lights off, I barely can see it. So anyway, I'm going to use that as helping me keep it straight, I hope.
This little curl right here on the peg head is prone to breaking off. And when I think of it, and I think, and I thought of it this time, whenever I think of it, I always put a plug in there. I don't do it on every single mandolin, but I do it on most of them. And uh, anyway, so I'm going to put a, I'm just going to cut out a, a hole here, put a wooden plug in that, with the grain going in an opposite direction. And that way, if the mandolin would happen to fall over and hit this spot right here, it won't break along the grain line or even the glue line. Now, the glue line is longer. I don't think the glue line would break. But this grain line from right here at this point up through here just runs almost straight. And that grain can bust. So if, if there's any hard impact in this area, that grain can break right through there. So that's what we're going to do is put a plug in there. And the hole depth there is, oh, I'm going to say approximately a quarter of an inch um, deep. And so that'll just be extra support. It spans not only the grain line, but it spans the glue line. So it'll just be extra strength in that area in case it ever needs it. Well, you can see there I've got the hole, I've got the little plug made. And uh, I'll turn the grain crossways of the other grain. <laughs> And I'll put the glue in here and just move that glue around. I'll use a toothpick here and just move it up on the sides. And I'll probably put a little more on, the, on this piece too, just to be safe. And then it can be squeezed into place, but it's a pretty tight squeeze. And you can see it forced a lot of glue out when it did that. And what I'll do then is uh, put a clamp on that for a little while. Oh, 30 minutes to an hour, something like that. And that'll uh, make sure that it won't come out of there and make sure it's seated all the way. That's forcing some more glue out, as you can probably see. So, it's all the way in there now. And that'll just make it that much stronger. You'll never see that little plug because it'll be underneath the veneer that goes on top of the peg head. In a shop talk a while back, and I don't remember when, and unfortunately I can't remember the customer's name now, but I covered it in a shop talk. He sent me these sanders for the drill. I was trying to use it in forward motion and it unscrews so I, I have started using it in the reverse motion and it seems to work just fine. So that's what I'm doing here. Let me get my close-up specs on and I'll show you how this works. So I'm sorry I can't call your name right now and maybe Melissa will know and put it on the screen hopefully but I, if not just know that I appreciate the uh, gift it works great and you know it's it's nice and smooth did a real fast job of uh, working on that heel there so it, it does work really well I do have to run it in reverse otherwise it comes loose I've tightened it up two or three times and uh, it just keeps coming loose but if I run it in reverse it works fine Some of you may not understand why it has to be run in reverse, and it's just a simple threading issue. You turn it one way, the threads unscrew. You turn it another way, the threads screw tighter. So uh, by turning it in reverse, it seems to hold the tightness. It seems to work just fine. And the sandpaper doesn't care which way it's being turned, so it doesn't really matter. I'll be honest with you, I didn't expect it to work as well as it does, so it does work really well. I thought the drill would probably turn it too slow to make it work effectively, but with a two-speed drill like this, it does work pretty well. If it was going a little bit faster, it might be just a little better, but this speed isn't really too bad. It, it does turn it pretty quickly. Pretty cool. Pretty darn cool. Show you up close what it looks like. It actually, it actually did a really nice job and that's just roughed out. I'll actually finish it with scrapers and things to get the detail in it that I want. 
but uh, that's not bad. That's a quick, quick way and saves a lot of hand rasping. So thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. I've decided to go ahead and profile this peg head even though I don't have the veneer on it. It's easier in one way to do it after the veneer is on here. It will take me a little bit more work to put the veneer on here after I actually profile this. But there's several logistical problems. Um, if Right now I would have to kick uh, Melissa off her computer for a while in order to get in there and work with the uh, laser cutter and the inlay and all that. And it takes an hour or so. So I'll just wait till the evening time and do that. But in the meantime, I can still be making progress on this. I would like to get the biggest part of this done today and, you know, keep moving. So that's why I've decided to go ahead and do it this way. Like I said, it takes a little more work, but not that much more. So I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is drill the hole for the little scroll here. So that's what she looks like after she's profiled on the bandsaw. Now we'll take it over to the spindle sander and clean that up. I will also have to take it over to the smaller bandsaw with the finer blade and cut that last little bit right there. But other than that, it's just about profiled. more hand work and that uh, will be in pretty darn good shape. A little work around here and different places like that. My friends, this is another one of those places where this will either go really well or I'll be crying. I'm going to cut out the next slot. I just use this table and I rock it back and forth, run it into the saw. I don't do a real complicated dovetail joint. I just do a very straightforward uh, just kind of a V joint and then we dowel pin it in place like it was done in the first book on the uh, Roger Simonoff book on building mandolins. I think that's a very good joint and I've just stuck with it. Friends, I've been off camera working on this neck joint quite a bit. Got it in pretty good shape. Every so often, I'll lay it down, fit it in there really good and snug, lay it down on the table here, and then, uh, actually it's not staying in there this time, wouldn't you know on camera. It's been staying every time until then. But anyway, I lay it down like so, and then I check down the length of the neck, and I check the center line, and it looks like it's lining up really well to me. So, to, uh, you know, get it down to the final fit, and you can see I'm just a little ways from fitting flush here on the bottom. I'm still inside there. This has to come up to the surface of this, and I've only got about a, oh, I don't know, a little more than a sixteenth of an inch to go. So, you've seen me use the carbon paper before. What I'm doing, I took a little strip of carbon paper here and I lay it in there like so. And, you know, I just push the joint relatively tight. Not, not as tight as I can get it because you can't pull the paper out. 
and then you just pull the paper out slowly like that and it will leave the black marks really clearly there for you to see. I think you can see them in the camera there. But anyway, those little black marks then, and then very carefully take those off. And you know, you just, all you wanna do, I mean, you wanna, basically we're sneaking up on the joint here. So you don't wanna go taking big deep gouges. You just take just the surface off, just enough to get rid of the black for the carbon paper there. And then basically you just keep doing that. It takes you a while. You gotta have some patience because it's gonna be a while. And you just do it time and time again. And there it did it again. Yeah, you only gain a very, very small amount. I would say less than a half a millimeter each time you do this. Probably less than that. So it takes a lot of turns, a lot of times doing that to get it down just right. But if you take your time and you keep checking everything, you'll get your joint really tight. Everything will match up perfectly. You know, you won't have any air gaps in there. You know, the tighter the joint, the better the strength. So it's worth doing and worth taking your time on. My friends, I probably said this earlier in the video, but I am really super glad that this was not the first wood I ever built an instrument out of. This quilted maple, it's actually easy to carve in terms of it's soft enough to carve and all that, but it is the hardest wood I've ever seen in my life to try to smooth out. You know, the grain runs in every different direction and no matter which way you go, you get what I call chatter. With the scraper, you get chatter. It just, it just, it just makes a rough looking finish. Like, you know, it's hard to explain. Even with the file, you get a quite a bit of chatter. The file works the better than the scraper does. But about the only way to get it smooth is really to sand it. So I've been doing a lot of spindle sander on this. I've been using that a lot to try to get this into shape. You cannot scrape it. I've scraped every kind of wood that I can imagine. I've scraped, you know, rosewood, paduke, you know, curly maple, uh, you know, redwood, spruce, western cedar, pretty much everything you can imagine. Sycamore, and none of those woods cause you any trouble when you scrape them. This does not scrape, period. Just, I've never seen anything like it. Just makes it fuzzy-like and just bounces the scraper. You know, I'm glad I have a lot of experience doing this because there's many other ways to get it smooth, but it's a lot more work, you know. Uh, the scraper just makes it so easy to just peel the wood right off and keep it nice and smooth and shape the, uh, the neck to the angle you want. So instead of that, I'm just having to do a lot of filing and it's taking a lot of time, but I'll get it there eventually. And I do have the neck joint fitting up just perfect. I've got this jig here. This is a jig I made that fits uh, my neck to the angle of the body and holds everything straight. You know, if I glue it up in this jig, I'm assured that the bridge height and everything will be perfect. I've got the joint fit up real good right here. Let me see if I can bring you in a little closer to see that. There you go. So I've got it fitting up real nice. This little cross member acts like a temporary bridge. It's just for height purposes. And I know if the top is laying on that and the neck joint is all tight and everything, and everything's straight, we're good to go. If you glue this in place now, it'll be glued on and you can be assured that it will be perfectly straight and everything will be in alignment. The angle to the top so that the bridge height is correct is gonna be perfect with this jig. So, I'm ready to glue it on, but I'm not gonna glue it on until I actually finish up the peg head here with the uh, inlay and overlay and the inlay and all of that. So, we'll move on to the next step, and that's going to be working on the peg head, I believe. Blah, blah.